Great Plays, Justice, a play by John Galsworthy. The National Broadcasting Company presents Great Plays, a series of famous plays selected to show the development of drama from the sunrise performances in ancient Athens down to the contemporary theater. We are privileged to have with us Mr. Burns Mantle, outstanding American drama critic and known throughout the country for his yearly volume of Broadway's best plays. He will act as commentator at today's production of Justice, Mr. Burns Mantle. John Galsworthy was not only one of England's great novelists, but one of her great dramatists as well. The novelist who wrote the Forsyth Saga was the dramatist who wrote today's great play, Justice, as well as, as those other great plays, The Mob and Strife, The Fugitive, Escape, Loyalties, and a dozen others. But a still greater honor was his. Before he was either a great novelist or a great dramatist, he was a great humanist and the perfect answer to any search for an honest man. Galsworthy wrote social dramas with his heart in the dock with society's victims, but with his mind on the bench with society's judges. So determined was he to be fair to both that he never seemed to be taking sides. He would have been a more popular dramatist if he had been more biased. But then he would not have been Galsworthy. He refused knighthood in 1918. Literature, he said, is its own reward. He was given the Order of Merit in 1929, and in 1932 he was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature. He died in 1933 at the age of 66. Justice is one of the earlier Galsworthy plays, the fourth, in fact, that he wrote. He, the son of, of a lawyer, had been admitted to the bar in London after winning honors as a law student at Oxford. Happily, he was a man of income and could do what he liked. He liked to travel and he liked to write. The first officer on one of the ships on which he sailed was a Polish lad named Joseph Conrad. Galsworthy read Conrad's first manuscript and it was partly because of his encouragement that Conrad became the great novelist of the sea that he did. Justice, which John Barrymore played in 1916 in New York, so impressed the actor that, according to Clayton Hamilton, he refused to have his name in as large letters in front of the theater as those of the author. It was one of Mr. Barrymore's first serious successes. In Justice, which I take to be Mr. Galsworthy's greatest work, wrote William Archer, we are made to realize with horror how the grim, inexorable machine of the law, once set in motion, will often, in spite of the good intentions of those who administer it, work the greatest mischief and destroy human values which a little insight and sympathy might have rescued. Justice is the story of William Falder, a clerk for a firm of English solicitors who gets into trouble through his sympathy for a woman he loved. Today, Falder will be played by Morgan Farley, Coxon by Eustace Wyatt, and Ruth Honeywell by Ruth York. We are shown first into the office of Falder's firm on a July morning. Coxon, the chief clerk, is there, already adding figures, when Sweedle, the office boy, interrupts him. Five, seven, twelve, thirteen, and carry one. Uh, and carry one. Yes? Uh, there's a party wants to see Falder, Mr. Coxon. What's the name? Honeywell. It's a woman. A lady? Uh, no, a person. Oh, ask her in and take this bank book to Mr. James. Uh, yes, sir. Will you come in, please? The young man's out. State your business, please. It's a personal matter, sir. Oh. Yeah. Would you leave a message? I'd rather see him, please. Well, it's all against the rules. Suppose I had my friends here to see me. Never do. No, sir. Exactly. And here you are wanting to see a junior clerk. Yes, sir. I must see him. Are you related to the party? No, sir. Dear me. This won't do, you know. Suppose one of the partners came in. There's some children outside oh, here, sir. They're mine, please. Well, shall I hold them in check, Mr. Coxon? They're quite small, sir. You mustn't take up his time in office hours. It's a matter of life and death. Life and death? He has fallen now, sir. Oh, uh, this lady wants a word with you, Falder. Yes, sir. I'll give you a minute, and it's not regular. He's on the drink again, Will. He tried to cut my throat last night. I came out with the children before he was awake. Is it all ready for tonight? Yes, I've got the tickets. Meet me 11.45 at the booking office. For God's sake, don't forget we're man and wife. Ruth. You're not afraid of going, are you? Have you got your things and the children's? I had to leave them for fear of waking Honeywell. All but one bag. I can't go near home again. All that money gone for nothing. How much must you have? Six pounds. Now, don't give away where we're going. When I get out there, I mean to forget it all. If you're sorry, say so. I'd sooner he killed me than take you against your will. We've got to go. No, I don't care. I'll have you. You've just to say it's not too late. It is too late. Here. Here's seven pounds. 
Booking office, 11.45 tonight. If you weren't what you are to me, Ruth. Kiss me. Oh, Will. Careful, here he comes. Sorry, minute tap. Thank you, sir. Thank you for allowing me to take up his time. Good day. This isn't right, Falder. It shan't occur again, sir. Um, by the way, before Mr. Walter comes, uh, have you finished up that cataloguing Davis had in hand before he left? I shall have done with it tomorrow, sir. For good. It's over a week since Davis went. Now, it won't do, Falder. You're neglecting your work for private affairs. I shan't mention about the party having called, but... Uh... Thank you, sir. Well... Morning, Coxham. Uh, good morning, Mr. Walter. My father here. Mr. James has been here since 11 o'clock, sir. I've been in to see the pictures at the Guildhall. Oh, have you now, sir? Yes. Uh, this right-of-way case, we've got them on the deeds. I know, but the intention was obviously to exclude that bit of common ground. We needn't worry about that, sir. We're the right side of the law. I don't like it. We shan't want to set ourselves up against the law, sir. Good morning, Walter. Good morning, Father. I'll just take Bolter's lease into young Falder to draft the instructions. I thought you told me yesterday the firm's balance at the bank was over 400, Walter. So it was. Makes 351. No recent checks. Just get me out the checkbook. Here you are. Now take the pounds and the counterfoils. Five, fifty-four, seven, five, twenty-eight, twenty, ninety, eleven, fifty-two, seventy-one. Tally? Tally. I can't understand. I made sure it was over 400. Give me the checkbook. Yeah. What's this 90? Who drew it? You. Here, let me see. July the 7th. Why, that's the day I went down to look over the Trenton estate. Last Friday week. I came back on the Tuesday, you remember? But look here, Father. It was nine I drew a check for. Let's look at that 90 check. Hmm. Seems all right. There's no nine here. This is bad. Who cashed that nine-pound check? Let's see. Yes, I gave it to Coxon. Look at that T-Y. Is that yours? My Y's curl back a little. This doesn't. Call Coxon. Coxon! Yes, sir? Yes, Mr. James? Coxon, do you remember cashing a check for Mr. Walter last Friday week, the day he went to Trenton? Uh, yes, sir. Nine pounds. Look at this. No, nine pounds. My lunch was just coming in, and of course I like it hot. I gave the cheque to Davis to run round to the bank. He brought it back all gold. You remember, Mr. Walter? You wanted some silver to pay your cab. You gave it to Davis, and Davis sailed for Australia on Monday. Hmm. That's black, Cookson. Why, this would be a felony. Oh, no, no, sir, there's some mistake. I'm afraid not, Cookson. A counterfoil altar, too, and a very deliberate piece of swindling. What was Davis' ship? City of Rangoon. We ought to wire and have him arrested at Naples. Oh, dear, dear, his poor young wife. Shall I go to the bank and ask the cashier? Yes, and bring him around here. And ring up Scotland Yard. Very well. My idea of dishonesty about this office. It hits me hard, Coxon. Mr. Coxon. Yes? She's popped up again, Mr. Coxon. In something she forgot to say to Falder. Impossible. Send her away. What's oh. that? Uh, nothing, Mr. James. A private matter. Here, I'll come myself. Now, you really mustn't. You can't have anybody just now. Not for a minute, sir. Now, really, really, I can't have it. If you want him, wait about. You'll be going out for his lunch directly. Yes, sir. Good morning, Mr. Coxon. Ah, uh, here you are, gentlemen. Come in this way. Mr. James is waiting for you. Here's the cashier now, sir. Oh, good morning, Mr. Carley. Oh, good morning, sir. You've seen my son here and myself. You've seen Mr. Coxon and you've seen Sweedle, my office boy. It was none of us who cashed the check, I take it? No, sir. I should remember the person's face. Quite a youth. Coxon, call in Mr. Falder, will you? Very well, sir. Falder, bring in the papers in Bolter's lease. Here they are, sir. Thank you. Do you want me, sir? No, thanks. Yes, sir. That's your man, Mr. Howe. Are you sure? Quite. He knew me. I suppose he can't slip out of that room. There's only the window, a whole floor and a basement. Where are you going, Falder? To have my lunch, sir. Oh, would you wait a few moments? I want to speak to you about this lease. Uh, yes, sir. If I'm wanted, I can swear that's the young man who cashed the check. It was the last check I handled that morning before my lunch. Here are the numbers of the notes he had. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Mr. Carley. Well, Father, what are you going to do? Have him in. I don't understand. I thought young Davis... Call him in. Mr. 
Folder, can you step in here a minute, please? Yes, sir. You know this check, Folder? No, sir. Look at it. You cashed it last Friday week. Oh, yes, sir, that one. Uh, Davis gave it to me. Yeah, I know. And you gave Davis the cash? Uh, yes, sir. When Davis gave you the check, was it exactly like this? Yes, I think so, sir. You know that Mr. Walter drew that check for nine pounds? No, sir, ninety. Nine, Folder. I don't understand, sir. The suggestion, of course, is that the check was altered. Whether by you or Davis is the question. I... I uh, take I, your time, take your time. Not by me, sir. The check was handed to Cookson by Mr. Walter at one o'clock. We know that because Mr. Cookson's lunch had just arrived. I couldn't leave it. Exactly. He therefore gave the check to Davis. It was cashed by you at 1.15. We know that because the cashier recollects it for the last check he handled before his lunch. Uh, yes, sir. Davis gave it to me because some friends were giving him a farewell luncheon. You accuse Davis, then? I, I, I don't know, sir. It's very funny. Davis was not here again after that Saturday, was he? No, sir. He sailed on the Monday. Was he, Falder? No, sir. Very well, then. How do you account for the fact that this naught was added to the nine in the counterfoil on or after Tuesday? How's that? A checkbook remained in Mr. Walter's pocket till he came back from Trenton on Tuesday morning. In the face of this folder, do you still deny that you altered both check and counterfoil? No. No, sir. No, Mr. Howe. I did it, sir. I did it. Dear, dear. What a thing to do. I wanted the money so badly, sir. I, I didn't know what I was doing. How ever such a thing could have come into your head? I can't think so, really. It was just a minute of madness. A long minute, Fowler. Four days, at least. Sir, I swear I didn't know what I'd done till afterwards. And then, then I hadn't the pluck, sir. Oh, look over it, sir. I'll pay the money back. I will, I promise. Go into your room. Y yes, sir. What's to be done? Nothing for it. Prosecute. But it's his first offence. I've grave doubts of that. I shouldn't be surprised if he was tempted. There was a woman came to see him this morning. The woman we passed as we came in just now? Uh, yes, sir. His wife? No, no relation. How do you know? Brought her children. Oh, it must have been the temptation of a moment. A man doesn't succumb like that in a moment. I've seen lots of these fellows in my time. Not doing any good with them except to keep them out of harm's way. It's penal servitude. I should like to give him a chance. I don't see how it's possible to spare him. He's gone to work in the most cold-blooded way to defraud his employers and cast the blame on an innocent man. We can't possibly tell the pressure that was on him. You may depend upon it, my boy. If a man is going to do this sort of thing, he'll do it, pressure or no pressure. If he isn't, nothing will make him. Suppose I were to have a talk with him, sir. Uh, that'll do, Coxon. I've made up my mind. Uh, pardon, sir. Yes? A gentleman from Scotland Yard is here, sir. Ask him to come in. Yes, sir. Uh, this way, sir, please. Detective Sergeant Wister from Scotland Yard, sir. Good morning. Mr. James, if you I'm only... sorry, Cookson. I'd stop short of this if I felt I could. Mr. Falder, you come in here, please. Yes, sir. This is your man, Sergeant. Oh, no, no. Come, come now. There's a good lad. I charge him with felony. Oh, sir. There's someone. I, I did it for her, sir. Let me be until tomorrow. You may take him away, Sergeant. No, no, no. Come, lad. Come along. There's a good lad. Three months later, on a bleak October day, William Falder is being tried for forgery in a London court. Opposite the bench and facing the judge sits the prisoner, a warden on either side of him. Harold Cleaver has already presented the case for the Crown, and Hector Froome, who is defending Falder, is just completing his introductory remarks. As to the actual events of the morning of July the 7th, on which this check was altered, the events on which I rely to prove the defendant's irresponsibility, I shall allow those events to speak for themselves through the lips of my witnesses. Robert Coxon. You swear by Almighty God that the evidence you shall give to the court and jury between our sovereign lord and king and the prisoner of the bar touching the matter in question shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Kiss the book. What is your name? Robert Coxon. Are you managing clerk to the firm of solicitors who employ the prisoner? Yes. How long had the prisoner been in their employ? Two years. Uh, no, I'm wrong there. All but 17 days. Had you him under eye all that time? Except Sundays and holidays. Yes, quite so. Let us hear, please, what you have to say about his general character during those two years. Well, he was a very nice, pleasant-spoken young man. I had no fault to find with him. Quite on the contrary. Do 
you give him a good character all round, or do you not? Certainly. Now, coming to the morning of the 7th of July, the morning on which the cheque was altered, what have you to say about his demeanour that morning? Well, in my opinion, such as it is, he was jumpy at the time. Will you tell us how you came to that conclusion? Yes, I will. You see, I have my lunch in from the restaurant. Chop and a potato. Saves time. Now, that day it happened to come just as Mr. Walter Howe handed me the cheque. Well, I like it hot. So I went into the clerk's office and I handed the cheque to Davis, the other clerk, and told him to get change. I noticed young Faldo walking up and down. And I said to him, uh, This is not the zoological gardens, Faldo. Do you remember what he answered? Yes. I wish to God it were. It struck me as funny. Did you notice anything else peculiar? I did. What was that? His collar was unbuttoned. Now, I like a young man to be neat. And I said to him, your collar's unbuttoned. And what did he answer? Stared at me. It wasn't nice. Stared at you? Isn't that a very common practice? Yes, my lord. But it was the look in his eyes. I can't explain my meaning, but it was uh, funny. Had you ever seen such a look in his eyes before? No. It made a very distinct impression on your mind. Uh, yes. Now, can you tell me of the morning on which the discovery of the forgery was made? Was there anything in the course of that morning, I mean before the discovery, that caught your attention? Uh, yes, a woman. You say a woman? Do you mean she came to the office? Uh, yes. What for? You asked to see young Falder. He was out at the moment. In the course of her appeal to see Falder, did the woman say anything that you especially remember? She did. Will you tell the jury what it was? It's a matter of life and death. Mrs. Honeywell said that? Exactly. Did Falder come in while she was there? He did. And she saw him and went away? Ah, uh, uh, there, I can't follow you. I didn't see her go. Well, is she there now? No. Thank you, Mr. Coxon. Your witness. Now, Mr. Coxon, you say that on the morning of the forgery, the prisoner was jumpy. What precisely do you mean by that word? Oh, I want you to understand. Uh, have you ever seen a dog that's lost its master? He was kind of everywhere at once with his eyes. Uh, thank you. I was coming to his eyes. You called them uh, funny. What are we to understand by that? Why, uh, funny. Uh, yes, sir. But what may be funny to you may not be funny to me or to the jury. Did they look frightened or shy or fierce or what? You make it very hard for me. I give you the word and you want me to give you another. Does funny mean mad? No, not mad. Funny. Very well, very well. Now you say he had his collar unbuttoned. Was it a hot day? Yes, I think it was. And did he button it when you called his attention to it? Uh, yes, I think he did. Would you say that that denoted insanity? That's all, thank you. Just a minute, please. Have you ever seen him in that disheveled state before? Oh, no. He was always very clean and quiet. That will do, thank you. Ruth Hannibal. Do you swear by almighty God that the evidence you shall give to the court and jury between our sovereign lord and king and the prisoner at the bar touching the matter in question shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Kiss the book. What is your name, please? Ruth Honeywell. You're a married woman living with your husband? No, sir. Not since July. Have you any children? Yes, sir. Two. Are they living with you? Yes, sir. You know the prisoner? Yes. What was the nature of your relations with him? We were friends. Friends? We love each other. Oh. What is your husband's business, Mrs. Honeywell? He's a traveller. And what was the nature of your married life? It doesn't bear talking about. Did he ill-treat you or what? Ever since my first child was born, Mr. Falder offered to take me out of it, sir. We were going to South America. Yes, yes, quite. And what prevented you? I was outside his office when he was taken away. It nearly broke my heart. You knew then that he had been arrested? Yes, sir. I called at his office afterwards and Mr. Coxon told me all about it. Now, do you remember the morning of Friday, July the 7th? Yes. Why? My husband nearly strangled me nearly that morning. Nearly strangled you? Yes, my lord. With, with his hands? Yes. Or... I just managed to get away from him. I went straight to my friend. In what condition were you? In very bad condition, sir. My dress was torn and I was half choking. Did you tell your friend what had happened? Yes. I wish I never had. It upset him? Dreadfully. Did he ever speak to you... About a check? Never. Did he ever give you any money? Yes. When was that? On Saturday. The 8th? Yes. To buy an outfit for me and the children and get all ready to start. Well, did that surprise you or not? What, sir? 
That he had money to give you? Yes, because on the morning when my husband nearly killed me, my friend cried because he hadn't the money to get me away. He told me afterwards he'd come into a windfall. And when did you see him last? The day he was taken away, sir. It was the day we were to have started. Oh, yes, the morning of the arrest. Well, uh, did you see him at all between Friday and that morning? Yes. What was his manner then? Dumb-like. As if something unusual had happened to him? Yes. Painful or pleasant or what? Like... like a fate hanging over him. Uh, tell me, uh, did you love the prisoner very much? Yes. And had he a very great affection for you? Yes, sir. Now, ma'am, do you or do you not think that your danger and ha unhappiness would seriously affect his balance, his control over his actions? Yes. His reason, even? For a moment like, I think it would. Was he very much upset that Friday morning, or was he fairly calm? Dreadfully upset. I could hardly bear to let him go from me. Do you still love him? He's ruined himself for me. Thank you. When you left him on the uh, morning of Friday the 7th, you would not say that he was out of his mind, I suppose? No, sir. Uh, thank you. I have no further questions to ask you. I would have done the same for him. I would indeed. Please, please. You say your married life is an unhappy one. False on both sides? Only that I never bowed down to him. I don't see why I should, sir, not to a man like Honeywell. You refuse to obey him. I've always studied him to keep things nice. Until you met the prisoner. Was that it? No. Even after that. I ask because you seem to me to glory in this affection of yours for the prisoner. I... I do. It's the only thing in my life now. Oh, well, step down, please. I call the prisoner, my lord. You swear by him what he got to the evidence you shall give to the court and jury between our sovereign lord and king and the prisoner at the bar. Touching the matter in question shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you, God. I do. Kiss the book. What is your name? William Falder. You are not married? No. How long have you known the last witness? Six months. Is her account of the relationship between you a correct one? Yes. You became devotedly attached to her, however. Yes. Though you knew she was a married woman. I couldn't help it, Your Lordship. Couldn't help it? I didn't seem able to. How did you come to know her? Through my married sister. Did you know whether she was happy with her husband? It was trouble all the time. You knew her husband? Only through her. He's a brute. I can't allow indiscriminate abuse of the person not present. If your lordship pleases. Mr. Falder, you admit altering this check? Yes. Now carry your mind, please, to the morning of Friday, July the 7th, and tell the jury what happened. I was having my breakfast when she came. Her dress was all torn, and she was, she was gasping and couldn't seem to get her breath at all. There were the marks of his fingers around her throat. Her arm was bruised, and the blood had got into her eyes dreadfully. It frightened me, and when, when she told me, I felt, I felt, well, it was too much for me. If you'd seen it, sir, having the feelings for her that I had, you'd have felt the same, I know. Yes. When she left me, because I had to go to the office, I was out of my senses for fear that he'd do it again, and thinking what I could do. I couldn't work all the morning I was like that, sir. Couldn't simply fix my mind on anything. I couldn't think at all. I seemed to have to keep moving. Then when Davis, the other clerk... Gave me the check, he said. It'll do you good, Will, to have a run with this. You seem half off your chump this morning. Then when I had it in my hand, I don't know how it came, but it just flashed across me that if I... if I put the T.Y. in the knot, there would be the money to get her away. It just came and went. I never thought of it again. Then Davis went out to his luncheon, and I... I don't really remember what I did till I'd pushed the check through to the cashier under the rail... I remember his saying, gold or notes. Then I suppose I knew what I'd done. Anyway, when I got outside, I wanted to chuck myself under a bus. I wanted to throw the money away, but I... I... well, it seemed I was in for it, and I... I thought at any rate I'd save her. Of course, the tickets I took for the passage and the little I gave her has been wasted, but all except what I was obliged to spend myself, I've restored. I keep thinking over and over. However it was, I came to do it, and how I... I can't have it all again to do differently. How far is it from your office to the bank? Not more than 50 yards, sir. From the time Davis went out to lunch to the time you cashed the check, how long do you say it must have been? It couldn't have been four minutes, sir, because I ran all the way. During those four minutes, you say you remember nothing? No, sir, only that I ran. Not even adding the T-Y and the naught? No, sir, I don't really. Thank you. But, um... 
You do remember running, don't you? I was all out of breath when I got to the bank. And you don't remember altering the check? No, sir. Uh, divested of the uh, romantic glamour which my friend is casting over the case, is this anything but an ordinary forgery? Come. Well, I was half frantic all that morning, sir. Now, now. Uh, you don't deny that the T.Y. and the naught were so like the rest of the handwriting as to thoroughly deceive the cashier? It was an accident. Queer sort of accident, wasn't it? On, uh, on which day did you alter the counterfoil? On the Wednesday morning. Was that an accident, too? No. Uh, to do that, you had to watch your opportunity, I suppose. Yes. You don't suggest that you were suffering under great excitement when you did that? I was haunted. With a fear of being found out? Yes. Didn't it occur to you that the only thing for you to do was to confess to your employers and restore the money? I was afraid. You desired, too, no doubt, to complete your design of taking this woman away. When I found I'd done a thing like that, to do it all for nothing seemed so dreadful. You knew that the Clark Davis was about to leave England. Didn't it occur to you that when you altered this check, that suspicion would fall on him? I thought of it afterwards. And that didn't lead you to avow what you'd done? I meant to write when I got out there. I would have repaid the money. Yes, but in the meantime, your innocent fellow Clark might have been prosecuted. I knew he was a long way off, Your Lordship. I, I, I thought there'd be time... I didn't think they'd find it out so soon. Has any uh, aberration of this nature ever attacked you before? No, sir. Hmm. You had uh, recovered sufficiently to go back to your work that afternoon. Yes, I had to take the money back. You mean the nine pounds? Your wits were sufficiently keen for you to remember that. Yes. And you still persist in saying you don't remember altering this check. That's all. Well, if I hadn't you. been mad, I should have been. I shouldn't have had the courage. Did you? Uh, did you have your lunch before going back? I never ate a thing all day. Now, as to the four minutes that elapsed between Davis's going out and your cashing the check, do you say that you recollect nothing during those four minutes? I remember thinking of Mr. Coxon's face. Of Mr. Coxon's face? Had that any connection with what you were doing? No, sir. Was that in the office before you ran out? Yes, and, and while I was running. And that lasted till the cashier said, will you have gold or notes? Yes. And then I seemed to come to myself, and it was too late. Thank you. That closes the evidence for the defence, my lord. If it please your lordship, gentlemen of the jury, my friend in cross-examination has shown a disposition to sneer at the defence which has been set up. He has alluded to the romantic glamour with which I have sought to invest this case. Gentlemen, I have done nothing of the kind. I have merely shown you the background of life which, believe me, always lies behind the commission of a crime. Just think of what your own feelings would have been, each of you, at the prisoner's age, and then look at him. You have heard the description of his eyes. The prosecution may laugh at the word funny. I think it better describes the peculiar, uncanny look of those who are strained to breaking point than any other word which could have been used. You heard me ask the prisoner what he thought of during those four fatal minutes. What was his answer? I thought of Mr. Coxon's face. Gentlemen, no man could invent an answer like that. It is absolutely stamped with truth. You have seen the great affection existing between him and this woman who came here to give evidence for him. It is impossible for you to doubt his distress on the morning when he committed his act. Gentlemen... If the prisoner be found guilty and treated as though he were a criminal type, he will, as all experience shows, in all probability become one. Gentlemen, justice is a machine that when someone has once given it the starting push, rolls on of itself. Is this young man to be ground to pieces under this machine for an act which at the worst was one of weakness? He can be saved now. Imprison him as a criminal and I affirm to you that he will be lost. The rolling of the chariot wheels of justice over this boy started when it was decided to prosecute him. We are now already at the second stage. If you permit it to go on to the third, I wouldn't give a farthing for him. Uh, may it please your lordship, uh, gentlemen of the jury, the facts in this case are not disputed, and the defence, if my friend will allow me to say so, is so thin that I don't propose to waste the time of the court by taking you over the evidence. <clears throat> the plea is one of uh, temporary insanity. 
But let us look at this plea of insanity. You've heard the woman. She has every reason to favour the prisoner. But what did she say? She said that the prisoner was not insane when she left him in the morning. You've heard the managing clerk, another witness for the defence. With some difficulty, I elicited from him the admission that the prisoner was not mad when the cheque was handed to Davis. The prisoner himself has told you the words with which Davis handed him the cheque. He obviously, therefore, was not mad when he received it, or he would not have remembered those words. We have, therefore, the plea that a man who is sane at ten minutes past one and sane at fifteen minutes past may, for the purpose of avoiding the consequence of a crime, call himself insane between the two points of time. <laughs> really, gentlemen, this is so peculiar a proposition that I, that I am not disposed to weary you with further argument. I ask you, in short, for that verdict of guilty, which, in the circumstances, I regard you as, unfortunately, bound to record. <laughs> Gentlemen, you have heard the evidence and the comments on it. My only business is to make clear to you the issues that you have to try. The facts are admitted. The defence set up is that the prisoner has, and he was not in a responsible condition, when he committed the crime. Now, if you think that what you have heard establishes the fact that the prisoner was insane at the time of the forgery, you will find him guilty, but insane. If, on the other hand, you conclude from what you have heard that the prisoner was sane, and nothing short of insanity will count, you will find him guilty. You must not allow any consideration of age or temptation to weigh with you in the finding of your verdict. You may retire, gentlemen, if you wish to do so. Gentlemen, are you agreed on your verdict? We are. Is it guilty or guilty but insane? Guilty. Clark, call upon him. Prisoner at the bar, have you anything to say for yourself why the court should not give you judgment according to law? No, nothing. William Falder, you have been given fair trial and found guilty. In my opinion, rightly found guilty of forgery. The defense was set up that you were not responsible for your actions at the moment of committing this crime, and that therefore you should be treated rather as a patient than as a criminal. We have heard the story of your relations with this uh, Mrs. Uh, Honeywell. On that story, both the defense and the plea for mercy were in effect based. Now, what is that story? It is that you, a young man, and she, a young woman, unhappily married, had formed an attachment, and the fact is patent that you committed this crime with the view of taking her with you out of this country. Now, however I might wish, I am not able to justify to my conscience a plea for mercy, which, if successful, would free you for the completion of this immoral project. The crime you have committed is a very serious one. I cannot feel it in accordance with my duty to society to exercise the powers that I have in your favor. You will go to penal servitude for three years. It is the day before Christmas that same year. We are in the office of the governor of the prison to which Falder has been sent. Through windows looking out into the exercise yard, we can see files of prisoners spaced four feet apart, moodily following serpentine lines on the pavement. The governor at his desk is talking to Wooder, his chief warden. It is the warden who speaks. It's a curious thing, sir, but there seems to be a regular wave of unrest going through the men just now. Odd thing, those waves, Wooder. I've seen it with horses before thunder. Come in. Oh, hello, chaplain. Hi, right, governor. That'll do, thanks, Mr. Wooder. Thank you, sir. Can you account for the state of the men the last day or two, Miller? No, I don't know of anything. Oh, by the way, uh, will you dine with us on Christmas Day? Tomorrow? Thanks, very much. Ground too hard for golf? Yes, a little. Uh, come in. A visitor who's been seeing Q3007 
Ask to speak to you, sir. Shall I put him off, sir? No, no. Let's see him. Don't go, Miller. Uh, right in here, sir. Thank you. I'm sorry to trouble you. I've been talking to the young man. We have a good many here. Name of Falder, Forgery. The fact is, I oughtn't to be here by rights. His sister came to me. She was in some distress. My husband won't let me go and see him, she said. Says he's disgraced the family. So she asked me to come, and I didn't like to refuse. And what I wanted to tell you was, he seems lonely here. Not unnaturally. I'm afraid it'll prey on his mind. I see a lot of them working about together. Those are local prisoners. The convicts serve their three months here in separate confinement, sir. But he's quite downhearted. I wanted to ask you to let him run about with the others. Hmm. Ring the bell, would you, Miller? You'd like to hear what the doctor says about him, I suppose. You are not accustomed to prisons, it would seem, sir. No, but it's a pitiful sight. He's quite a young fellow. I said to him, before a month's up, I said, you'll be out and about with the others. It'll be a nice change for you. A month, he said, like that. And he held his hand up to his face, and I could see the tears trickling through his fingers. It wasn't nice. You rang, sir? Ask the doctor to be good enough to come here for a minute. Yes, sir. Now, uh, let's see, let's see. He's not married? No. Uh, but there is a party he's very much attached to. Uh, not altogether come ill foe, of course. Uh, it's a sad story. The woman had a nasty, spiteful fellow for her husband, and she's left him. Fact is, she was going away with our young friend. Uh, it's not nice, but I've looked over it. Well, when he was put in here, she said she'd earn her living apart and wait for him to come out. That was a great consolation to him. But after a month, she came to me and said she couldn't even earn the children's living, let alone her own. So she thought she'd better go back to her husband. I didn't like to persuade her not to. Surely, no. Uh, yes, but I'm sorry now. It's upset the poor young fella dreadfully. And what I wanted to say was, he's got three years to serve and... I'd like things to be pleasant for him. The law hardly shares your view, I'm afraid. But I can't help thinking that to shut him up there by himself will turn him silly. Nobody wants that, I suppose. I don't like to see a man cry. It's a very rare thing for them to give way like that. I keep dogs. Indeed? Yes. And I say this. I wouldn't shut up one of them all by himself month after month. No, not if he bit me all over. Come. Oh, come in, Doctor. This gentleman thinks the separate is telling on Q3007. Falder, young, thin fellow, star class. What do you say, Dr. Clement? Well, he doesn't like it, but it's not doing him any harm. But he's told me. Oh, of course he'd say so, but we can always tell. He's lost no weight since he's been here. It's his state of mind I'm speaking of. His mind's all right. I'm watching him carefully. I'm glad to hear you say that. I'll make a point of seeing him today. I'm much obliged to you. I think you may safely leave it to us, sir. Yes, yes, of course. Thank you, sir. Oh, there's just one little thing more. Yes? This woman. I suppose I mustn't ask you to let him see her. It'd be a rare treat for them both. He's thinking about her all the time. Of course, she's not his wife, but he's quite safe in here. They're a pitiful couple. You couldn't make an exception. As you say, my dear sir, I couldn't make an exception. He won't be allowed another visitor of any sort till he goes to a convict prison. Open uh, all the cell, would it? Ask the doctor to come here. Yes, sir. Falder. Yes, sir. Uh, come out here. Now, tell me. Can't you settle down, Falder? Yes, sir. You know what I mean. It's no good running your head against a stone wall, is it? No, sir. Well, come. I... I try, sir. Can't you sleep? Very little, sir. Between two o'clock and getting up's the worst time. How's that? I don't know, sir. I, I was always nervous. Oh, everything seems to get such a size then. I feel I'll never get out as long as I live. That's morbid, my lad. Pull yourself together. Yes, I... I've got to. Think of all these other fellows. They're used to it, sir. They all had to go through it once for the first time, just as you're doing now. Yes, sir. I'll get to be like them 
In time, I suppose. Well, that rests with you. Now, come. Set your mind to it like a good fellow. You're still quite young. Man can make himself what he likes. Yes, sir. Take a good hold of yourself. You've had a visitor. Bad news? Yes. You mustn't think about it. How can I help it, sir? Oh, hello, doctor. Take Falder inside and have a look at him, will you? Certainly. Come along, Falder. Sorry you should be troubled like this, sir. Very contented lot of men on the whole. You think so? Yes, sir. Oh, it's Christmas doing is, in my opinion. Queer, that. Big pardon, sir? Christmas. Do you think we make show enough, sir? If you'd like us to have some more, Ollie. Not at all, Mr. Woodard. Very good, sir. Well, Doctor. I can't make anything much of him. He's nervous, of course. Uh, any sort of case to report? Quite frankly, Doctor. I can report on him if you like. But if I do, I ought to report on others. I see. The poor devil must just stick at them. What's that noise, Mr. Wooder? O'Cleary banging on his door, sir. I thought we should have more of that. That's not O'Cleary. There's someone else, too. Yes, sir. Who is it? It's... It's Folder, sir. After two long years, we are back in the solicitor's offices and again find Mr. Coxon at his desk. Coxon is a little grayer, but otherwise quite unchanged. A knock at the door interrupts him. Yes, come in. Good morning. Hi, oh, hello, it's you, Mrs. Honeywell. Quite a stranger. Must be two years. Sit down. Family well? Yes. I'm not living where I was. I couldn't stay with Honeywell after all. <laughs> You've not heard from the young man, I suppose, since he came out? Yes. I ran across him yesterday. I hope he's well. He can't get anything to do. It's dreadful to see him. He's just skin and bones. Oh, dear me. I'm sorry to hear that. Didn't they find him a place when his time was up? He was only there three weeks. It got out. Oh, I'm sure I don't know what I can do for you. Now, about this matter... I I'm... just want a chance, Mr. Cookson. I've paid for that job a thousand times and more. I have, sir. No one knows. But they got you a place, didn't they? Yes, but one day, all of a sudden, the other clerks got wind of it, and I couldn't stick it, Mr. Cookson. I couldn't, sir. Now, I... easy, easy, my dear fellow, easy. I had one small job after that, but it didn't last. Yes, how was that? It's no good deceiving you, Mr. Cookson. 
I didn't act as I ought to have about references. And that made me afraid. And I left. In fact, I'm... I'm afraid all the time now. Oh, I feel for you. I do, really. I've slept in the park three nights this week. The dawns aren't all poetry there, so... Oh, but meeting her, I... I feel a different man this morning. I've often thought that being fond of her is the best thing about me. It's sacred somehow, and yet it did for me. That's queer, isn't it? I'm sure we're all very sorry for you, Folder. That's what I've found, Mr. Coulson. Awfully sorry for me. But it doesn't do to associate with criminals. My dear Walter, as far as the brief itself is concerned, I... Well, um, uh, I didn't expect you quite so soon, Mr. James. I've just been having a talk with this young man. I, I think you both remember him. Quite well. How are you, Folder? Very glad to see you again, Folder. Thank you, sir. Uh, just a word, Mr. James. Uh, Folder, if you'll just step into your old office there for a minute. Oh, certainly, sir. Gentlemen, I wanted to ask you, Falder's had his lesson. Now, we know all about him, and we do want a clerk. Uh, jailbird in the office, Coxon? I don't see it. The rolling of the chariot wheels of justice. I've never quite got that out of my head. What's he been doing since he came out? He's had one or two places, but he hasn't kept them. I think we owe him a leg up. He brought it all on himself. What about that woman he was mixed up with? Well, sir, I can't keep anything from you. He has met her. Is she with her husband? No. Falder living with her, I suppose. Oh, I don't know that of my own knowledge, sir. It isn't my business. It's our business if we're going to engage him, Coxon. Well, uh, I ought to tell you, perhaps. I've had the party here this morning. Uh, I thought as much. It won't do, Coxon. He must make a clean sweep of it or he can't come here. Poor devil. Won't you have him in, sir? I think I can get him to see reason. You can leave that to me, Coxon. His whole future may depend on what we do, Dad. <laughs> All right, Falder, come along. Yes. Now, look here, Falder. My son and I want to give you another chance, but there are two things I must say to you. In the first place, if you've any notion that you've been unjustly treated, get rid of it. You can't play fast and loose with morality and hope to go scot-free. I never wanted to do wrong, sir. Perhaps not, but you did. Now, my boy, what you've got to do is to put all the past behind you and build yourself up a steady reputation. And uh, that brings me to the second thing. This woman you were mixed up with... You must give us your word to have done with that. But, sir, it's, it's the one thing I look forward to all that time. And she, too. Oh, I couldn't give her up. I couldn't, sir. Oh, sir, I'm all she's got to look to. And I'm sure she's all I've got. I'm very sorry, Falder, but I must be firm. No good can come at this connection. It was the cause of your disaster. If she's anything of a woman, she'll see it for herself. If there were a prospect of you being able to marry her, it might be another thing. Well, it's not my fault, sir, that she couldn't get rid of him. She would have if she could. Oh, that's been the trouble from the beginning. If anybody would help her. It's only money wanted now, I'm sure. Honeywell must have given her full cause for divorce, since, well, she could prove that he, that he drove her to leave him. I'm inclined to do what you say, Falder, if it can be managed. Oh, sir, she's down in the street now. Will you see her? I can beckon to her from the window. Yes, let her come in. Oh, thank you, sir, thank you. Uh, Mr. Gaines, she's not quite what she ought to have been. Uh, she's not done as she should, you know, while this young man's been away. She's lost her chance. We can't consult how to swindle the law, sir. There's been nothing between us, sir, to prevent divorce. What I said at the trial was true. And last night we just sat in the park. Uh, pardon, sir? Yes? Mrs. Annie will. I'm sure in. Uh, we've asked you to come up, ma'am, because there are certain facts to be faced. I understand that you've only just met Falder again. Yes, only yesterday. And I promise to take him back here if he'll make a fresh start. Ruth... Mr. Walter Howe is good enough to say that he'll help us to get a divorce. I don't think that's practicable, Falder. But, sir, you... Now, Mrs. Honeywell, you're fond of him? Yes, sir. I love him. You don't want to stand in his way, do you? Uh, I could take care of him, the sir. The best way you can take care of him will be to give him up. But nothing, nothing shall make me give you up, Ruth. You can get a divorce. There's been nothing between us, has there? No. We'll keep apart till it's all over, sir. If you'll only help us. We the promise. The situation is impossible. Must I, sir? I put it to you, ma'am. His future is in your hands. Uh, I want to do the best for him. Yes, sir, that's right. But uh, that's right. I don't understand. You're not going to give me up, Ruth. After all this, there's something... Oh, sir. Sir, I, I, I swear solemnly there's been nothing between us. Yes, I believe you, Falder. Come, my lad, be as plucky as she is. But just now you were going to help us. I... Ruth. Ruth, what is it? You've not been... 
Oh, no, no. Oh. Father, there, there, there. That, that'll do, that'll do. I'll give you your chance, Falder. Don't let me know what you do with yourselves, that's all. Here, here, uh, come in here, both of you. You'll feel better by yourselves for a minute. Come in. Detective Sergeant Worcester, sir. Sorry to disturb you, sir. A clerk you had here two years and a half ago. What about him? He's failed to report himself this last four weeks. How do you mean? Particularly, he won't be up for another six months, sir. I see. Did he keep in touch with the police till then? We are bound to know where he sleeps every night. I dare say we shouldn't interfere, sir, even though he hasn't reported himself. But we've just heard that he... There's a serious matter of obtaining employment with a forged reference. What, the two things together? We must have him. We're very busy at the moment. Now, if you could make it convenient to call again, we might be able to tell you then. I'm sorry, but I'm afraid he's here now. If you don't mind, I'll just have a look around. Uh, here, Stand here. back, please. Please, please do. I can't. Oh, who's that? Come along, my lad. No, no, no. Oh, let him go this time, for God's sake. No, he couldn't take the responsibility, sir. <laughs> Good. Good. Come along. Sorry, gentlemen. Good day. Oh, oh there, there now, ma'am. That finishes him. It'll go on forever now. What's that? Sweetle, see, see what that was. Yes, sir. The woman, she's fainted. Coxon, have you any brandy? I've got sherry. Well, get it quick. Here you are, sir. It's good, strong sherry. Give us a hand here, gentlemen, will you please? What is it? It's heavier than you think. Why, it's folder. Here you are, here. Just lay him down here. Oh, the poor lad. What happened, Sergeant? He jumped over the banisters. Next broken. Good Lord. He must have been mad to think he could give me the slip like that. And what was it? Just a few months. Was that all? What a desperate thing. Oh, Sweetle, run for a doctor. Yes, sir. Oh. Oh. Uh, quick, Mr. Walter, she's coming too. Oh. Now, there, there. there now. Oh. You're all right now, ma'am. What's happened? What is it? What is it? Let me go to him, I must... Oh! Well! Well! What's the matter? What's happened? Well! Well! Oh! What? He's... He's not... Breathing! Oh! Oh, my dear! I'm oh. sorry, ma'am. I must take him. No. no, you can't take him now. He's dead. Oh, dear, dear. Oh, poor dear woman. No one will touch him now. Never again. He's safe with gentle Jesus. And so William Falder's debt to society was finally paid. But society's responsibility to William Falder was not even considered. As a result of the production of justice, however, it is satisfying to know that the penal laws of England were at least modified. Next week, as you will see by your great play's manual, Bernard Shaw's fame back to Methuselah will be given, and in the author's own adaptation for radio. That should be something worth hearing. Today's performance of Justice by John Galsworthy was directed by Charles Warburton.